Well, friends, our scripture lesson today is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Well, you know, a lot of people here, actually, a lot of members of, of our congregations, congregants have been, you know, only here for the last few years, so they don't actually remember the worship space uh, after the fire. And so w- w- what I wanted to remind you of is that's actually what it looked like after the fire. So that was the morning after the fire. Uh, see that nice big section of roof uh, in, in the back there? Uh, the roof had just been replaced and then after the fire, we got a call from our roofer, and he said, um, I heard you had a fire. How'd my roof do? And we said, well, your roof is fine, but it's a floor now. <laughs> right, so that's what it looked like. And then now, you know, if you drove in, you notice what's happening outside. And this is what it looks like on the inside now. Is the, the roof, the decking is almost complete, and the insulation and shingles go on next. And then it's just one big room, and, and people are noticing So I have people coming up to me and they're saying, oh, you're finally doing something. It's finally, (laughs) finally being built. Yeah, I know. It's like that. It's really painful. Okay. Yeah. And here's the thing. They don't understand how much it took to get to this point. Like, here's a little video, all right, of we used to have a basement under there that we don't need anymore because the basement just held a gas furnace and the whole system is going to be electric now. So we needed to fill it in. We filled it in with uh, pulverized concrete. It's recycled. So actually the whole basement was filled in with pulverized concrete that was recycled from demolished buildings. And so they're just giving the stuff away. You pulverize it and you use it as, as fill. And, and this is a picture of, them, of what it took to fill the basement since you still have the walls standing. So how do you get truck after truck after truck after truck after truck of this pulverized concrete in. This is how they did it. They had an ejector through the window, filling it in, and then a bulldozer leveling everything out. Now here's the thing. We shot that, I shot that video outside exactly one year ago Friday. December 8th, 2022 was the date we filmed that. But we weren't doing anything until just a couple months ago. (laughs) Here's the thing. You have to do a lot in order to start. And the Gospel of Mark begins with this interesting verse. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It sounds like something that you would just gloss over. You just go right past until you actually think about and realize this is a very strange way to start a book. I mean, you don't open up any other book and it begins with, this is the start of the book. Well, of course, did, did you think I thought there were pages missing or something? <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you don't start a book with this is the start. I mean, can you imagine turning in a paper in college and saying, dear professor, this is the start of my paper. You know, they'd be like, yeah. <laughs> Someone will try that, I'm sure. So it can't just mean that this verse is the start of the Gospel of Mark. Of course it is. So the real question is, what does he actually mean by saying that? And that's what we're going to unpack. As soon as he says this, he goes right into talking about John the Baptist. He goes right into saying, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, I am sending my messenger who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And he talks so much about preparing. And this is a question that I think that we might have, which is why 
do you have to be prepared for the coming of Jesus? Why can't Jesus just show up and do his thing? Why do you have to be prepared? And the reality is that in most everything in life, whether it's filling the basement before we build a roof, whether it's doing other things, preparation precedes progress. All right, You can't actually do things without the preparation, and the preparation is often the painful part. Right? Anyone ever paint a room? Right? The worst part is the spackle and the sand and the sanding, right? Ever try to paint a wall without sanding the wall? It does not work really well. People want to do that all the time. They would love to skip the sanding, go straight to the painting. They go, hey, if I put like three coats of paint on, is it going to be okay if I didn't sand the wall? They don't want to do that step, but you have to do it. The preparation precedes the progress. And that first step of preparation is like the sanding of a wall before you paint it because what John does is he offers a baptism of repentance. The baptism of repentance, that thing of saying that, there, that I need to let go of certain things, I need to turn from what I was doing, things need to be different than they were before Jesus can come into my heart. See, that repentance is simply a matter of admitting that things aren't right. That's the first preparation, to admit that something isn't right. This is the first step of so many things that are important in our lives. No matter what it is that you're trying to, to move away from, move toward, often you simply have to begin by saying, the way things are isn't right. I have to admit that I need help. I have to admit that I'm unhappy. I have to admit that things just don't feel the way they ought to feel. I have to somehow admit that something is wrong as preparation for moving on a path toward making it right. But the biggest hurdle in that is the reminder that the way things are has a lot of power. The way things are has a lot of inertia. It's really difficult to overcome the way things are, even when we understand that the way things are isn't the way things ought to be. There's a, a Christian leadership speaker uh, that I've come to listen to and like. His name is Ryan Leak. And he was talking uh, about how so many people seek work-life balance, right? Everybody here, anybody not want work-life balance? I mean, everybody wants work-life balance. And he said, here's the problem with work-life balance. He said, the problem with work-life balance is that work gets on the scale first. It's the problem. Work gets on the scale first, and then you frantically try to add enough life to balance out the amount of work that's on the scale, and it's really hard, but the work got there first. How would it be if the life got there first? What would it be like if, if you put as much life as you want, as feels good, on the scale first and said, I'm only going to add enough work to balance out the amount of life that I want to have. If you try that, it's not going to be a popular move. If you try that, you're going to be regarded as strange. I don't know, they're going to call you a communist or something. I have no idea. But they're going to be saying, you're, this is really weird. Right? Society isn't built for people who put life first and then only add as much work as balances out the life that they want. It looks so weird that you're going to be regarded the way John was. I mean, John doesn't wear the right clothes, doesn't eat the right foods. What a weird man, clothed with camel's hair, ate locusts. His appearance is symbolic of the extent to which he's countercultural. His appearance is symbolic of the extent to which he is saying that the way things are aren't the way God wants them to be. And he looks really out of step with the world around him. But that, being, that out of step nature was the step that was needed toward moving things to, what, to the way they ought to be. Because so often in our lives, right does seem very strange. 
So often in our, in our lives and in our society, doing things the way God would want you to do them seems very strange to the world. It requires you to reject cultural norms if the cultural norms are out of step with what God wants. Okay. So rejecting the cultural norms of our society can make you seem as strange to your friends or your co-workers as someone who eats locusts. But that's the first step. The first step is having the courage to be out of step with the world and in step with what God wants. And after that repentance, after that decision that that's the way you're going to be, then comes the Holy Spirit. John baptizes with this baptism of repentance, and then, then comes the positive force of the Spirit teaching us what God wants. And it's at that point that the question becomes, are we prepared to receive that teaching? Now, how are we prepared? What prepares us to receive the teaching of, of, of Jesus? It's fundamentally character. Character is the preparation that matters. Character is when we know what's right or wrong. Character is values. The values that you hold, the values that you're willing to live for, that defines character. And it's actually really hard for the gospel to overcome character. It, you really can't expect that what God's going to do is override your will and suddenly take your character and transform it. To the extent that the gospel transforms character, it's generally a matter of willing, the, uh, of your willing cooperation in the process and being willing to do it over a very long time. It's when you understand what's going, what you need to be doing, then you begin to do it, and then maybe you begin to do it a little more, and then maybe you did a, do it a little more, and then eventually your values shift and conform. But so often that just never happens because the, they hear the teachings of Jesus, and then their character says, no, this is out of step with who I am, so I'm simply not going to follow. And so when Jesus came on the scene... His teachings were rejected because the people were simply not prepared to hold his values. He comes on the scene and, and he says, you know, you need to forgive people who've wronged you. And they're basically like, I don't want to. You have to love your enemies. And they're like, I don't want to. You have to be generous with what you have. And they're like, I don't want to. They couldn't do it. And so Jesus' teachings were rejected by people whose character had not prepared them to hear the teachings of Jesus, to receive the teachings and begin to obey. And the worst thing we can do is hear that and understand that and think that that was only a problem back then. Jesus' teachings were rejected. Jesus' teachings are rejected today by people whose character prohibits them from being able to be willing to follow what Jesus wants. This is why we have such a problem of people who claim to be Christian, who claim to be followers of Christ, and don't act anything like it. It's because the knowledge of the gospel isn't able to overcome a hardness of character. They hear Jesus say, love your enemies. And they say, I, un I hear that, but I'd rather keep my enemies. Thank you. They hear Jesus say, forgive those who've wronged you. And they say, sounds good, can't do it, won't do it. They hear Jesus say, care about the least among us. And they go, I have my own problems. No time for that. It's a big problem today when our character isn't willing to accept what Jesus teaches. And ultimately, it's the character that determines our response to Jesus. See, our circumstances determine what we can do. Right? Circumstances determine what you can do. 
all right? <clears throat> you want to be generous? Great. Well, we understand your circumstances determine how generous you can be in practical terms, all right? We never write a check for more than the balance in your checking account. That's kind of a basic rule, all right? So your, your circumstances determine what you can do. All right. Understand that parents, incredibly busy, with your kids. I mean, you're chasing kids around all the time, taking them everywhere. It's like, it's like two parents need five cars to be able to take their kids to the places they need to get to, all right? So you can't give time that you don't have. You can't give resources that you don't have. You can't give time that you don't have. So we understand your circumstances determine what you can do. But it's your character that determines whether you wanted to do it in the first place. Your character determines whether you will. Your character determines what you want to do. Your character means that if your character isn't in the right place, it doesn't matter what kind of resources you have, you're hanging on to them. If your character isn't the right place, it doesn't matter how much free time you have, you're not going to put it to good use. So we understand, everyone's got different circumstances. That's why Jesus' teaching about things like the widow's mite is so important. The widow just gives a, a little bit, but it's all she had. Fine. Her circumstances dictated what she could do, but her character dictated what she wanted to do. And your character is, gonna, is not going to be changed by your circumstances. If you're not generous, humble, honest, trustworthy now, wealth, notoriety, responsibility is not going to change that. If you're not generous with what you have, you won't be generous if you have ten times what you have. Your circumstances will not change your character. That's why you have things like the parable of the talents that we had just a, a couple weeks ago uh, as a scripture passage because the person who did the right thing with what he was entrusted with was entrusted with more. He just showed that his character was in the right place. Because your character will determine whether you are going to do as much as you can with what you have or as little as you can get away with with what you have. And that decision in your life of how you're going to live into Jesus' teachings is the reason why Mark prefaced his gospel by calling it the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. The entire book is the beginning. The entire book is the beginning. He's not saying this, these words are the first words of the book. That would be ridiculously stupid. Instead, what he's saying, this book is the beginning of the good news. The entire story of Jesus' life is the beginning of the good news. And what's really interesting is that the way Mark ended the gospel, go home, look it up in your Bibles, the way Mark ends the gospel was so dissatisfying to people that later on, it's, it's definitely readily determined by early manuscripts, they added on an ending. So if you go home and you open up your Bible, all the modern Bibles will identify, there's only 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark, okay? All of them will identify that the sh what they call the shorter ending of Mark ends at verse 8. And then there's a few more verses that they call the longer ending of Mark. And every scholar says, goes back and they find old manuscripts, the longer ending of Mark was tacked on. Because the original ending of Mark at the end of verse 8 just stops. It stops. It cuts to back. It's like the final episode of The Sopranos. Remember <laughs> when The Sopranos just goes, boom. You're like, what? Wait, what? what? What's going to happen? Okay, or Inception, right? Just boom, cuts to black. All right, I hate it when shows do that. I hate it when shows do that. And Mark does that. They go, the tomb is empty, cut to black. Leaving you going, what next? What next? Cut to black, what, 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 what next? 
So much so that people wrote a what next and tacked it on to the end of Mark because they hated that ending. But I think what Mark intended was to say this whole book is the beginning of the gospel and then I am going to end it cut to black and ask you, how does your life finish the book? How will your life be the continuation? How will your life be the ending? The gospel, the teachings, all that Jesus said and did is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and the rest of the good news is what you do with it, is how you live into it. Your life is the rest of the book. Your character determines how you receive the teaching. And then you decide the ending that you're going to write to the good news that Mark gave to you. Amen.